morning, everybody. Today is Election Day in the United States of America, and I think it's very appropriate that today I have a man with me, visiting with me, whose parents were conservative, raised you as a conservative, um, taught you right from wrong, taught you to go to church, taught you to follow the rules, and later you enforced rules as a GBI agent for how many years, John? 30 years. 30 years. John Cagle, um, you pretty much gave your life to the state of Georgia because 30 years is about all they get out of it on a workforce, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> you did it for many, many years. And um, why did you choose a career with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation? Well, you know, when I uh, graduated from college, I came back to Jasper. And, and uh, I, I come from a family of school teachers. My mother was a teacher, my grandmother was And for was everybody, teacher. anybody alive who doesn't know, his mama, the most beautiful Southern belle ever, Miss Eliza went to be with the Lord. How long ago? Um, November 22nd, it'll be a year. And at the same time, your book was being written? Yes, I was uh, working on it uh, in, in the, her hospital room the morning she died. Wow, wow. So Miss Cagle was um, one of those women, when you met her, she just, she shined. Yeah. She shined forever, she and did. you always remembered your encounters with her and the kindness in her heart and right. uh, and your dad. Can we yep. talk a little bit about daddy yep. first? Yeah, uh, my father was uh, the postmaster in Jasper for mm -hmm. many, many years and mm -hmm. he he and his father and brothers opened Kegel Funeral Home back in the late 40s. And, right. And uh, in the uh, mid 70s, when I came back to, to teach high school in Jasper, uh, my father was transferred to Raleigh, North Carolina with the Postal Service and so he and mother moved to Raleigh and then later to Oklahoma City where he retired in 1985 from Postal Service. Mm -hmm. and at that time I was living in Gainesville and my sister Tammy was living in Gainesville and so instead of moving back to Jasper, mother and daddy built a home in Gainesville so we could all be there together. Mm -hmm. And when you chose your career rather than teaching, what took you to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation? Well, you know, I guess growing up, and I mentioned this in the book a little bit, growing up, uh, young boys always play cops and robbers and I always wanted to be the cop and curious uh, curious yeah and, and uh, we had a, a GBI agent come to the high school one day it was like a law enforcement appreciation day mm -hmm. and, and I, I began to listen to what their presentation was about and I think I was the most inter interested one there uh, and so I, I decided I'd just apply uh, I, I didn't have any law enforcement background uh, other than teaching high school. Did you have to change and go back and get more schooling or were you? Uh, no, I, I, I was actually, when I was hired, you know, they, they trained us. Mm -hmm. We had to go to the police academies mm -hmm. and the GBI agent academy and, and all of that. So I, uh, rather than a teacher, I began to, to be the student again mm -hmm. in the late mm -hmm. 70s. Wow, okay, growing up, in, in the woods, in the area where we hunt and we fish and we do things. Were you already an avid sportsman? Did you handle guns? Did you? No, no, no I, I didn't. I, no. I, I wow. was never a hunter. Uh, and gosh, I, I'm sure I had fired a, a, maybe a, a 22 rifle growing up with mm -hmm. my father. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I was not a gun person. And, and uh, all of a sudden in the late 70s, I had to carry one every day. Yes, yes. Now, what was your training like? Is it six weeks, six months? How do they do that? Uh, it depends. Uh, the, the basic academy back then, the GBI Academy, was like 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you add on other weeks of training each year. So. Uh, and you knew immediately that's where your heart was? I did. Yeah. I did. Yeah. It was fun. And do you still have relationships with people that you met during that 30 years that oh, you yeah. still stay in touch with? Yeah. yeah. And, and I tell people, uh, when, when I retired, uh, and, I, and I tell them to this day that I, I miss GBI every day, mm -hmm. uh, and it kind of reminds me of a, a movie, uh, The Shawshank Redemption. Right. Uh, years ago, it was about uh, inmates in a, in a prison who had been there for you know, 20, 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. and they became institutionalized and, mm -hmm. and uh, struggled when one of them was released. He just wanted to go back. So. I think to a degree I was institutionalized at GBI mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, it, was your life. it was my life and, and, and I made some great friends and still uh, mm -hmm. still I stay in touch with a lot of them. If, if we chose a case other than the case we're going to talk about shortly, <coughs> were you involved in the um, Atlanta bombing? 
uh, at the Olympic Park probably. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I had just gotten off duty that night. I was the supervisor, or one of them, at the Olympic Village, mm -hmm. which was right next door to the Centennial Park. And right. I had just gotten back to my room uh, and, and actually felt the, the bomb go off. Wow. Uh, and uh, that changed everything for the next several, several days during the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it was just, uh, it was a bad time. And it actually changed Atlanta forever because there were circumstances that pointed a finger at somebody who was completely innocent. That's right. Richard and Jewell. Richard Jewell um, had nothing to do with this. And he, he was an innocent bystander. And sadly, um, his life was kind of destroyed because of it that. Was. Yeah. It was. It, it yeah. actually was. And you know, Eric Rudolph was not only responsible for that bombing, but uh, an abortion clinic in Atlanta and mm -hmm. also one over in Alabama. Birmingham, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then he fled, obviously, up to uh, uh, Murphy, Western North Carolina. Western North yeah. Carolina. I was working in Murphy then, and it was very interesting because every day I passed by the dumpster where he was captured. Yeah. And um, it was so strange. And, and so the day all this happened, um, I have some friends who worked at WSB, and they said, hey, we're going to be in the area. We're going to go up there. They've captured him, and we're going to. And I said, okay. So I went up and spent the day there. And, and I just kept thinking, every day I drove by this dumpster. But they said that he remained on the run because so many people helped him. Yeah, he, that, that area of uh, North Carolina, uh, they, they don't really care for the government that much. Right. And he, he had to have had substantial help over the years, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. And it, it was kind of ironic that you know, the world was looking for Eric Rudolph. And he was at, right there at, at home. And a, and a rookie police officer is the one that found him. Yes, yeah. And it was kind of one of those, if he hadn't been going through the dumpster, he probably would have never been caught. Probably. Yeah. And, and had people given up on him, we actually adopted two dogs, and I wish I could remember the guy we adopted him from. He worked for the GBI, but all of his time was given to look for him. Mm -hmm. And so we adopted his two German Shepherds. And he said, I just don't have the time to give the dogs, and my wife isn't interested in doing it because we're looking for Eric Rudolph. And, and I said, but y'all been looking for him for years. And they <laughs> said, we're still looking, That's you know. Right. And it was one of those uh-oh moments, you yeah. know. It just happened. Yeah. And um, it, it's one of those cases that some people wanted to have it solved. Some people wanted him to serve time. Other people thought that what he did was right, which was crazy, right. you know. But the life it destroyed was Richard Jewell. Yes, it did. Yeah. It did. And sadly, he died very young. And uh, I'm sure the stress that he was put under right. had something to do with Probably. it. Probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, there was another case uh, when I was working in, in Atlanta in 1980. I, I had not been on the GBI, but for a year, year and a half, which was the uh, kind of the peak of the time when the murdered and missing children yes. cases in Atlanta. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and that was... Uh, Atlanta suffered for, for mm -hmm, a long, long time mm -hmm. because of that. How do you feel about that case? How do you feel about Wayne Williams? I think he did it. You do? Yeah. Okay. Um, I've, I've always wondered because um, I don't think they recovered many bodies, though, did they? Yes, they, they recovered I mean, a lot of bodies, but uh, he was only convicted of two or three, maybe. Okay. And why uh, was that? Uh, <coughs> they probably didn't have uh, enough physical evidence to link him to all the bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, they, they took the, the best cases and, and tried him, and he was convicted. And I think more than likely they thought that he was responsible for the others, but they just didn't have enough physical evidence to charge him. Wow. Yeah, yeah. and that was actually the, one of the first fiber cases in the state of Georgia, maybe even the country. Uh, mm -hmm. One of our lab... Wasn't it uh, some carpet or something? It was carpet in, yeah. the, in the back of her, his station wagon. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of our lab scientist worked that case and it was it was I think one of the first fiber cases in Georgia at least. Why would someone kill innocent children? I don't know. Uh, uh, Wayne Williams. And I, not I, just one, not no, just no, two, no, yeah. not just three, but multiple. Yeah, multiple. Yeah. Uh, he, I, I'm not that familiar with the, the ins and outs of that case, but uh, you know, Wayne, I, I think, was a photographer, you know, wanted to be a movie maker and things mm -hmm. like that. And usually uh, that... Imagination? Could, that, that's the ruse, you know, yeah. to, to get folks to uh, sit still and, and mm -hmm. let you film them and then do what you're going to do. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. That is absolutely crazy. Now, <clears throat> your last case happened to be your most terrific case. 
everybody in Georgia, I'm sure remembers, and most people in the nation remember, when a beautiful young lady came missing. And um, she had gone for a walk, for right. a hike, right. in a place that she was familiar with, and her life ended. Yeah. Tell me why this case, besides the horrific nature of it, um, does it haunt you still today? Yes, it does. Uh, I think about Meredith Emerson every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, this case started, Meredith was, by all accounts, anybody who knew her uh, felt she was the all-American girl. Mm -hmm. uh, she, had she looked amazing. Yeah, yeah just beautiful girl. <coughs> uh, she was 24 years old and she graduated from uh, UGA and was living down around uh, Buford near the Georgia Mall with her roommate, mm -hmm. uh, Julia. And uh, th they all went out for New Year's Eve celebrations uh, uh, on December 31st of 2007. And uh, Meredith got home a little bit early before midnight uh, to beat the traffic. And the next day she got up and she had a black lab uh, puppy that she had trained and very mm -hmm. proud of it and, and decided that she would take Ella, the, the black lab, uh, hiking. And, uh, and I remember that day uh, because January 1st is really not, uh, you know, a good day in, in terms of the weather most of the time. It's, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's, by then it's pretty cold. Right. But that day it wasn't. It was, it was uh, as, as my father used to refer to, uh, Carolina blue sky and, and uh, about 50 degrees. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that beautiful was a, good day day. For a walk. beautiful day for a hike. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she went up to Blood Mountain an area that she was familiar with and had and been hiking before. Uh, and, and I got an education in this case because I was not familiar, I'm not a hiker, and I wasn't familiar with the Blood Mountain uh, approach trail. And uh, I call it the approach trail because uh, it, it um, climbs Blood Mountain to the summit where it intersects with the Appalachian Trail. Wow. And, uh, Probably one of the most beautiful places It ever. is, it's yeah. one of the, and, and, and I learned it's one of the most uh, it's, it is the hiking destination for Georgia when, mm -hmm. uh, because of when you reach the summit, you can see like three states and, and it's, uh, uh, it's, it's really pretty. So she decided to uh, take Ella mm -hmm. up uh, to Union County mm -hmm. uh, t and uh, there, there's a parking lot. Uh, uh, it, at the time, it was a gravel parking lot uh, where you leave your car and then take the, uh, take the trail up. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, when she didn't come home uh, the following day and didn't show up for work, uh, then that set off the alarms for her, her roommate and then later her, her uh, uh, a family friend that lived in Athens who mm -hmm. reported her missing. Wow. Now, do you, did he tell you <coughs> that he abducted her on the trail or in the parking lot, or did you get that kind of information? On the trail. On the trail. We... Uh, the GBI didn't get involved initially because, uh, you know, a, an overdue hiker is not that uncommon. Mm -hmm. uh, could have been lost. It could have been lost or injured. Mm -hmm. uh, but after some hikers who were on the trail New Year's Eve uh, discovered some uh, things on the trail, uh, some water bottles, some dog treats, mm -hmm. and the thing that was really alarming was uh, a police uh, expandable baton, mm -hmm. which was left or found near the water bottles. When they turned that into the little hiking store nearby, uh, that was the trigger that uh, I believe the local authorities used to call us because they, they were thinking this might be something other than an overdue hiker. Right, right. And, and that's how we became involved. <coughs> so we, uh, uh, about a half a mile from that parking lot is Vogel State Park. Mm -hmm. And that's where we set up our command uh, center. Uh, and that's where we, we worked out of the rest of the week. And besides those few items that were found there, were there other items found during your initial investigation? Uh, w we later found a uh, uh, military style uh, knife, mm -hmm. straight, straight edge knife. Uh, that we were able <coughs> to link uh, to the offender in, in the Florida case. Mm -hmm. uh, at one thing I learned also that the hiking community, uh, especially the Appalachian Trail hiking community, uh, is, is a, a very close-knit group. And what we saw, which was amazing to me, uh, volunteer hikers, the word went out, mm -hmm. uh, and volunteer hikers 
started showing up, wanting to look for Meredith. I mean, right. by the hundreds. Uh, and so we had to uh, organize the, the search parties using the volunteers. Uh, uh, and my, my objective was to run the criminal investigation mm -hmm. while the local emergency management folks uh, handled the uh, search effort. Uh, so we set up shop there at Vogel, and uh, the following day after she was reported missing by uh, her godmother, uh, her parents came in from Colorado where they lived. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember meeting them uh, in their, uh, we got them a cabin, and I remember walking over and meeting them, and uh, you know, they were horrified, as anybody would be, mm -hmm. but I, mm -hmm. I, 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 this was my last case, and this is the first time I'd broken a, a very important rule. Uh, investigators during criminal investigations are hesitant to give specific information about the direction the, uh, the case is going. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily because people may disclose it, but they might be talking about it and somebody overhear it. And right. So we just always keep things close to the vest. But when I met the Emersons, uh, I knew that I had to tell them that everything that was going on in real time right, because right. I promised myself that <coughs> that they would hear it from me before they heard it from anybody else. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, so at this point in time, you're a day in. You have a water bottle, um, a baton, later a knife, and that's pretty much all you get out of that. That's all we got out of it. But wow. one thing we uh, we always do in these kinds of uh, events, uh, we establish a, a telephone tip line. Mm -hmm. We, we couldn't do it at Vogel because there were, I think there was a pay phone and one hardline phone and, mm -hmm. and cell phone service was very limited so we decided to uh, set up the tip line there at the local sheriff's office in Blairsville. One thing I told the sheriff, uh, who was a friend of mine, that uh, we had to have people, real people answer the phone. Mm -hmm. uh, because Don't leave a message. No, yeah. Uh, yeah. if you have a message line uh, a, a lot of people are so afraid to call that they have to have to get courage mm -hmm. and and may never call back if they if they get a, a, a <coughs> tape line you know they'll just hang up and say well I tried right. so right. Uh, we began getting we, we asked the public through the news media and this was a unique situation too because you know the satellite trucks the news media trucks came to Vogel and stayed the whole week right and we used them to push out information, and they did very quickly, and did a great job doing mm -hmm. that. And we mm -hmm. started get, getting leads and uh, into the tip line. We asked, and I asked, uh, anybody who saw Meredith on the trail, or was on the trail New Year's uh, Eve, uh, to call. Mm -hmm. And we immediately began getting calls. And it was a uh, so the unique thing was we had all these volunteer hikers showing up that we had to feed and clothe. Mm -hmm. uh, the temperature had dropped and now it's in the single digits mm -hmm. and just, just terrible conditions. Uh, and we saw the community up in Blairsville and the surrounding area. Uh, they responded, a lot of church groups came and fed everybody and mm -hmm. uh, made sure they had what they needed. And at it that was, time there was hope, wasn't there? There was hope. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, that maybe we could we, we could find her, and ironically, that's that's her middle name. So we, we were thinking, wow. well, you know, you always hope, mm -hmm. uh, but the longer these things go on, uh, the, the, the worse it seems. And to the become. temperature dropping had it to have, was, yeah. You know, had she been injured uh, on the trail, uh, you know, we were concerned that she couldn't survive in that weather. Right, right. Now, a day into this, um, is it already beginning to take a toll on you? Uh, yeah, because the, uh, in, in this case, the victim, uh, Meredith, was such a good person. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and their family and friends, ev ev all of her friends were just like she was. Mm -hmm. uh, and her family was just very, very good, good, decent people. And, and just to see the, the horror on their face every yeah. time I would brief them that you know, we were still looking, but you know, we weren't getting very mm -hmm. far. But we did get a break, uh, <coughs> and got a call in the tip line from a, a man who worked in Atlanta, had a business, mm -hmm. and he said, uh, uh, "I know who you're looking for." And he said, "I remember. I'm getting cold chills now reading that in the book. I remember that was the point that you're like, oh my God." Yeah. 
this is a real person who is a monster. That's right. So uh, he identified uh, Gary Michael Hilton uh, as the person that we were looking for, and he said uh, he lives in a van in the forest. Uh, the description that we had gotten from other hikers on the trail uh, matched uh, Hilton's description, so we were able to get a photograph. Mm -hmm. And the media, again, was, was wonderful, and they, uh, they pushed the photograph out, so now we're, we're looking for somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, and we began to get information and calls from people who knew him. And al almost every call that we got from somebody who knew Gary Hilton was troubling because we were finding out more about him. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it wasn't that he stopped to help her or to render aid to her because she may have fallen or been hurt. Everybody suspected that something bad had happened at that point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There was nothing good. Well, we're going to take a commercial break, and when we come back, we're going to hear the rest of the story. I want to encourage you to purchase this book. I want to encourage you to sit down with your family. I want you to read it. I want you to think about a 30-year career that sadly ended with um, a horrible case a horrible monster, um, and not only did he take this beautiful young lady's life, there were other lives involved in that too, and we'll talk That's about right. that when we come back in just a couple of minutes. Georgia Medical Treatment Center now has two locations to bring you the high quality holistic care you've come to know and expect. We treat neck, back, and joint pain with chiropractic care and injection-based treatment without the need for surgery or prescription painkillers. Our medical weight loss program can also provide relief while ridding your body of toxins, pounds, and inches while improving your overall health. Call today for a free consultation, 770-345-2000, or go online to georgiamtc.com. Whether you're swimming in the sea or splashing in the pool, making a masterpiece or just making memories, writing a great American novel or writing your term paper that's due tomorrow, whatever you do in life, Farmers is here to protect it. For all your insurance needs, call Donald Curtis in Blue Ridge. When traveling internationally, know where you're going and what the environment is. Also, don't dress to stick out. Dress to blend in with the environment and the culture. Make sure that you put minimal information on your luggage tags. Airlines actually track your bags, which you can follow through your app anywhere domestically and internationally. Also have a medical plan. We have mobilized rescue system. These systems are the only integrated medical technology that can integrate to your phone and be used abroad and domestically for any medical emergency that you have. If you have any questions or concerns about travel security or training, please contact Titan International. Whether it's memories of your first trip to the local Dairy Queen or your daily visit for a $5 lunch special, the Jasper Dairy Queen has been a part of the community for over 40 years. Locally owned and operated, Jasper DQ is the place where specialty items often become favorites. Burgers, shakes, chicken tenders with yummy dip and gravy, and don't forget the rings and fries. Celebration cakes are always fresh and fast and include the awesome blizzard cake. Stop by where folks are always meeting and eating. 515 and Highway 53. Just follow the crowd to the Dairy Queen. High-speed Wi-Fi. Not quite as important as running water in your home, but close. Ignite Internet from ETC powers your Wi-Fi network with consistent speeds to keep all your gadgets going strong. Streaming video players, laptops, tablets, even smartphones, so you're never stuck with those big cell data charges. And talk about value. Just pick your speed and keep the Wi-Fi flowing in your home at a great low price. Upgrade your Internet today. Call or visit etcnow.com to learn more. Okay, we're back. Um, the book is called Those Days in January. This is the story of um, the last case that John Cagle worked as a GBI officer for over 30 years and quite possibly the case that you, you told me that your mom died the morning that you had just finished reading this and editing and she didn't even know this was going to happen. No, uh, I was going to surprise her with it. 
uh, and, and read it to her. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd been working on it all summer. Uh, but uh, And I, she I, saw the impact it had on you. Yeah, she did. She saw how it, it, it was tough. It was tough and it would have been great for her to have seen what you've accomplished with this and how many I, lives I, you've I, touched. I, yeah. I think so. Now, <clears throat> as we get to day three, how are things coming into play? Well, we know who we're looking for. Uh, we've learned a lot about him, mm -hmm. uh, and everything we learned about him only compounded the, the, the feelings that everybody had that, you know, if, if he had her, this okay. wasn't going to turn out good. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we move into Thursday afternoon, and we get a call into the tip line uh, from his former employer, actually the one who had called us and identified him to mm -hmm. us the day mm -hmm. before. Uh, and he had gotten a call from him, and, and uh, Hilton told him uh, he wanted to turn his life around and, and, but needed some money. And so the, uh, the former employer told him, I'll leave a check for you in, in my business that Hilton had access to mm -hmm. in Atlanta, mm -hmm. uh, and, and told him just to come by and get it. Uh, when we found out about that call, uh, we learned that the call had been placed from Marble Hill, Georgia, uh, at a, Huddle House? It was a, the, the house phone, not a pay phone, the house mm -hmm. phone of a Huddle House. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we got the f telephone number, we traced it back to the Huddle House, obviously. Uh, and we uh, had the DeKalb County SWAT team watch the business in Atlanta or in DeKalb County. Uh, and, and he never showed up. He never went to get the check. He never went to get the Isn't check. That's something. Do you think he got spooked? What do you What do you think I, the reason? We later, we later, when we interviewed <laughs> him, he, he was spooked uh, mm -hmm. about that. Uh, so at that time, he was camping with Meredith in Dawson Forest, not far from the Huddle House. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, why do you think he kept her alive as long as he did? Well, the the first night, the uh, he tried to access her bank account through her. ATM mm -hmm. card mm -hmm. in uh, the first attempt <coughs> was in Blairsville and it was so we're at theft at that point it's not murder it's gonna be theft right uh, and and the attempt in Blairsville at the bank was not successful uh, there was another attempt in Gainesville later on that night that was not successful mm -hmm. were y'all watching her account at that point in time or not yet well we had asked the bank uh, and, and they had told us that they're monitoring her account for us and they would notify us immediately uh, if there was activity. Of course, uh, they didn't. Wow. We found out uh, later on, that uh, late on Friday, that there had been these attempts, but mm -hmm. prior to that uh, time, we didn't know the bank. And, and we called them every day. So the bank dropped the ball. They did. Yeah, and, absolutely. And to, because we called and documented those calls mm -hmm. every day to check on activity. Mm -hmm. And then on Thursday, uh, before he made that call, he, he, there was another attempt in Canton. Uh, and they're all unsuccessful. So he's keeping her alive. Hoping Canton, Ball Ground, Gainesville. I mean, no, Blair, no Canton, Blairsville. Marble Hill. Yeah, Blairsville. All these attempts, all these places. Right. And the bank missed it. They didn't report it, no. Dang, that's crazy. Uh, that, was, that was the setback. Yeah. Uh, but uh, she, she wouldn't give uh, the correct PIN number because mm -hmm. I, I, I believe she would have known what uh, would Could happen. In the end would have happened. Yeah. 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 And why the desperation and why did the end happen? Did he, what do you think? Um, what do you think drives a crazy man to do what he's done? He's already killed three people at this point, so. On, uh, on Friday morning, uh, they're camping in Dawson Forest, and uh, a truck, uh, kind of a heavy truck, was misdirected into the forest with with uh, the driver's GPS. GPS, I remember that. Yeah. And uh, it caused him to get stuck. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hilton saw him, and the guy said, "I'm going to have to call the police to come, you know, help me get a record to get this thing pulled out." Hilton tried to talk him out of it. Uh, but then when he, when he saw he couldn't, uh, he panicked and, and decided that it was time for him to go. And uh, at that point, that he, that's when he killed Meredith. Wow. So was she in the van? Was she bound? Was she, I mean, obviously she was athletic. She could have run if she could have gotten loose. So obviously he had her 
constrained to yes. a point that she she couldn't help herself. That's right. Wow. And this guy, the truck driver, was that close to her. Yes. So right. many so many instances that could have changed the outcome. Yep. So many instances that could have changed the outcome. Right. Okay. The day that it ends, um, how long was it then before you found him and, and you got everything taken care of? Uh, our tip line got a call uh, late that afternoon uh, from a lady who was in a grocery store in Forsyth County. And, and she had been following the case on the news. And she said, I, I think I'm looking at the dog, Ella, the black lab that y'all have been looking for. Uh, and it turned out to be Ella. Mm -hmm. And next door to the, that was at a Kroger store. Next door to the Kroger was a quick, quick trip service station. Mm -hmm. The next call into the tip line was from a lady who uh, said that she had just received a phone call from Gary Hilton from that number, a number, which we quickly traced to the payphone at the quick trip. Uh, so we're, you know, we're trying to get to that area as fast as we can, and we, we did. And we identified Ella through a, the ID chip that it was in fact uh, okay. Ella. Uh, but uh, Hilton was nowhere to be, be found. Uh, did you have a correct tag number on him? No, we didn't. No. Uh, so simply because now he's 80 miles south of the abduction site, mm -hmm. uh, we put a lookout in Metro Atlanta uh, for the van mm -hmm. and for him uh, and began a crime scene search there at the quick trip. And we found in the dumpster at the quick trip what we had hoped that we wouldn't find, mm -hmm. which was evidence of uh, uh, found some bloody clothing, found uh, Meredith's identification, driver's license, and some other pieces of evidence there. Mm -hmm. Not long after that, uh, 911 in DeKalb County got a call from a citizen who said that, uh, you know, I think I'm looking at the guy that y'all have been looking for. He's cleaning out his van at a, at a car wash. And so DeKalb County, were, they were able to grab him for Was it somewhere near Buford? No, it was yeah. over there near, uh, uh, just off four, Highway 400, mm -hmm. uh, near Lenox Mall, I think. Okay. And uh, So he's getting gas and he's getting around. He's traveled a lot during yes, this time. Yes, he has. So he had some, he had some money, even a though he bit. wasn't able to get money out of her account. A little bit, yeah. Wow. So they grab him for us and uh, we try to interview him and, and he, uh, he doesn't want to be interviewed. So uh, he invokes his rights. Uh, to an attorney, so we, we can't interview him any further then. The following day on Saturday, we bring him up to Blairsville to the jail, and uh, we charge him with kidnapping with bodily injury. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you had her identification. We did. Bloody clothes. Yeah. And um, had her dog. Yes. And, and thankful her dog was okay. Yes. But that's it. Yeah, and uh, so we're back up at Vogel, the, the investigative team in our cabin, you know, thinking, well, what do we do now? Uh, we can't talk to him. We don't know where Meredith is. Had he lawyered up at that time? He had lawyered up. Yep. Mm. And uh, so I, t I told <coughs> uh, the agents sitting around, uh, which some of them were surprised by it, I think. I said, we got to get this man a lawyer because that's the only way we can communicate mm -hmm. with him is through his lawyer now. Mm -hmm. And I called the district attorney for that area and I, I told him the same thing. And he said, well, if we need to see if he qualifies for a appointed lawyer. And I said, well, he lives in a van in the forest. You know, yeah. I, I think that he probably will. Yeah. Uh, and then that Sunday morning, I get a call from the prosecutor and he said, okay, we've appointed a lawyer and uh, they're going to talk to him. And so uh, I met his lawyers at the jail in, in Union County and, and I simply told them, I want to know where Meredith is. And after about three hours, uh, talking to him, they came out and, and asked me if I would call the prosecutor to see if uh, they would take the uh, death penalty off the table. Mm -hmm. And I did, and uh, he agreed. And at that point, did you know about the other victims? Yes. Yes. We, okay. we, were, we were beginning to get information okay. about uh, two, vic two victims in Wasn't North Carolina. One husband and a wife. Husband and a wife in North Carolina and, mm -hmm. a, and a nurse in Florida. Right. Uh, so, uh, Ironically, after the uh, lawyers talked to him, another lawyer showed up from Atlanta 
who had represented Gary Hilton in the past on some minor things. Mm -hmm. uh, but as it turned out, the lawyer told me uh, about a movie that he, the lawyer, had made and Gary Hilton had been a, an advisor. And in a nutshell, the movie was about uh, an abduction. Uh, a, a man who lived in the mountains in North Georgia who would go down to Metro Atlanta, abduct uh, women, bring them back up to the forest and release them and hunt them. Oh and I'm gosh. thinking, you know, wow. Uh, <coughs> so uh, the following day on Monday, uh, and, and this is seven days in, mm -hmm. uh, Hilton agrees to, uh, in exchange for the death penalty taken off the table, uh, to tell me where Meredith is. Mm -hmm. You know, at this time, I'm thinking seven days that you've dealt with this emotionally, physically, and um, you want it to end, but you want it to end for her family. Yes. And it's all about her family because you would have gone on and on and on for whatever time to solve this case to whatever you had to do. But once it got down to you knew she was not alive anymore, right. did that really take you down or did it give you something you had to fight to get her from well, her family? Well, we had both. Uh, you know, when we, when we discovered what we found in, in, in the uh, dumpster, you know, I, I, I told the family mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and then that sort of let the air out of everybody's sails on uh, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, the volunteer searchers. Everybody, right. everybody was so disappointed that now right. we're, we're really in, in search and recovery mode rather than uh, mm -hmm. The Rescue. other. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. At that point in time, um, was he, had you physically sat there and had to deal with him or was his attorney doing everything? Uh, had you had one-on-one -on -one contact with him? I had not until Monday afternoon late, which was uh, January the uh, 7th. And what was that like? Uh, he's, he, you know, the, the, the thing that was made this case the worst is because, again, the victim was such a good Mm -hmm. good person, mm -hmm. uh, and that the offender is such a bad person. Mm -hmm. I mean, he is absolutely evil. There's good and evil in this world. Yeah. He is yeah. absolutely yeah. evil. And uh, he, he was brought into a, a room where me and another agent were with his lawyers, and uh, I simply said, you know, where's Meredith? And he began to tell me mm -hmm. uh, in very detail where she was mm -hmm. and uh, given specific directions and uh, what he had done to her and, and all of that. And uh, all that had happened in Dawson Forest in Dawson County mm -hmm. where they had camped. Uh, Why did he lead Vogel because of all the search, obviously? And he chose, to, had, had he been hanging out in Dawson Forest before? Had he been there before? Was he familiar with it? He's very familiar with all the uh, management areas in mm -hmm. Georgia and the southeast, really, because that's where he traveled. and. Because we think of Amicalola Falls, that's, right. that's a place where people go often. Right. Uh, but he was very familiar, uh, actually had maps in his van of, of a lot of the management areas and, mm -hmm. and uh, places like Dawson Forest. And uh, so he gave me very specific information and as he was telling me that, I remembered uh, exactly where he was talking about because I, and I mentioned this in the book, I'd actually worked a part-time job after high school before I left to go to mm -hmm. college I remember uh, that. in the exact area that he's mm -hmm. describing to mm -hmm. me and, and I was I was very familiar with it. You know, we, we didn't talk much about what happened at the Huddle House but um, the fact that he went in and used their phone and I know I interviewed the people around the Huddle House, it was very hurtful to them that they weren't able to stop this. You know, that somebody didn't recognize him in there, that somebody didn't because it had been all over the news. It had, it had It been. was all over the news and just, you know, there were so many cases, so many instances in this case where one person making a difference, and, and I think you've hit on the, the helpline. If you see something that doesn't look right, call oh, you somebody, call. You call, call somebody, yeah. Because there were so many times that this could have had a different outcome. Yes, there, there were several opportunities that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, might have caused this to end differently. Did he stay in the huddle house and have a meal? Did no. he sit down? Okay. He went and used the phone. Uh, he engaged with the people who were working there a little bit. Uh, but as soon as he got off uh, the phone, he left because Meredith was chained in the van. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the worst part of the story, 
you found her body in different graves? Is that correct? No, she was not buried. Okay. Uh, uh, he had uh, uh, killed her and decapitated her mm -hmm. and had uh, covered her, her body up with uh, leaves and brush, not buried. Mm -hmm. uh, and it had uh, taken her head uh, and we were able to recover it about a mile away. Why did he do that? Uh, he, he, I asked him that and he said uh, for forensic purposes and, oh and he's thinking probably hairs and fibers and things like that but uh, uh, I, I think he did because he... Uh, he's evil. He's evil. Th this man is beyond evil. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, beyond evil. Has there ever been any remorse? Have you ever no. seen anything? No, no. No, no. no he's... Uh, uh, people can go online and, and see about a four and a half hour interview with him uh, where he's all over the place. I mean he is a He's a true serial killer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we later, uh, as we got into the other cases, uh, in the Florida case, he decapitated that victim and cut her hands off. What uh, is wrong with this world? And the North Carolina elderly couple, he killed the, the wife, uh, blunt force trauma to the head, and then ended up uh, shooting the, uh, the male victim. And all for, was he just money. robbing them? Yeah. Yeah, that's what he said for money. Yeah. yeah. I actually think he, you know, he progressed and began to enjoy it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And after your interview and after the trial, were you there for each trial? Uh, in Georgia, he actually, and that's one of the reasons I call it those days in January, because this was unique. and I've never seen this happen anywhere else. Uh, he abducted Meredith on January the 1st, and he pled guilty and was sentenced to life in prison in Georgia uh, on January 31st. So everything in Georgia happened days. in 31 days. <coughs> uh, and then he went to trial in uh, Florida, and I went down for the trial mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of days and, and watched that. And then after he was convicted in Florida, he pled guilty to the two murders in North Carolina. And got li uh, it was a federal case, and he got life without release in mm -hmm. North Carolina. And Florida does have the death penalty. They do. And we can assume that it will be done as soon as he gets through with all these wasting money and wasting time and wasting energy. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And somebody has to be his attorney. I know how reading the book made me feel toward him. And I, I can't imagine how it made you feel. Yeah. But for an attorney to have, that is his job, to represent his client. How hard could that be in these cases? I, 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 you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how anybody could, but you know, they have a job to do, and mm -hmm. and, and and most of the time when it gets to those kinds of uh, appeals, uh, you know, it, he's guilty. Everybody knows he's guilty. Right. And uh, they're just trying. Why to keep him alive? Yeah. Why waste a dime? Yeah, Why I, do I, it? I agree. I, yeah, that's you know, crazy. The, ne the next time I see him, uh, will be the the afternoon that he's executed. Mm -hmm. Will you go to his execution? Yes, yes, yes. Good, good, good. Now, when, when we look at your 30-year career, um, you grew up in the hills of North Georgia where we had a little moonshining going on. Mm -hmm. We had a little car thieving going on. We had a, a few other things being thieved around. Drugs, drugs was a big deal, a lot, of, a lot of drugs. And today we are still facing a drug crisis in North Georgia. Um, when you retired, were you happy to get away from all of that? Uh, in, in a way I was, but uh, again, going back to the uh, uh, the Shawshank Redemption, I was institutionalized mm -hmm. and I was... Mm -hmm. That's your uh, life. It, it, it's your life at the time and you have to try to do what you can to get over it. Uh, mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I don't don't guess I am quite over it yet because I've just recently gone back to work in it. So. <laughs> now what are you doing? I, I read something you're doing. Are you working for one of the counties? I'm working for Pickens County, my yes. home county, yes. and, and the, the sheriff down there, Donnie Craig, uh, talked to me uh, uh, about a month ago about coming back and, and supervising their investigative unit. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. uh, I've been doing that for a month now. Right. And, and we do have a drug crisis. We do. We do have a drug crisis. And sadly, I think that being shut down and job loss and income loss and depression is making it worse. Yes. And I, I yesterday so. we talked about that because um, I've seen people who had done well <coughs> relapse lately. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some things happen and it's because we are in that time. And yesterday we did a program and, and my co-host town, Red, White and Blue, she's representing America out on black and white. And I had little hearts and I said, 
this is a time in America that we are seeing good and evil, and we are seeing good and evil. We're seeing some great things happen. We're seeing some horrific things happen. Right. And um, we, have you ever been to Alaska? No, I haven't. Okay. In Alaska, they have the highest incest, highest drug abuse, highest alcoholism, and much of that is attributed to their life because it's dark a lot, mm -hmm. and it's a gloom and doom, mm -hmm. desperation almost. And so as we go into winter, not only are we going into winter, we're going into a time that many jobs were lost, a lot of businesses closed, and um, we have seen a lot more drug activity, which is, right. it, it's very sad. That's it's very it is, sad, yeah. yeah, yeah. When you talk to the sheriff about this, I mean, does he kind of, what, what do you do? You throw up your hands. What can you do? How can you stop it? How can we stop the drug crisis in America? Well, uh, we've been dealing with this for a long, long time, and, and uh, you know, every time that law enforcement uh, does something, reacts, mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, the offenders, whether they're violent offenders or, or drug offenders, uh, they react also. So mm -hmm. it's it, it's always changing, mm -hmm. and and that creates a difficulty for for law enforcement and the legal system because uh, sometimes we have to start completely over. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what makes it tough. Uh, in the drug business and, and at GBI, I worked in, on several drug units. You know, you try to be proactive as, as much as you can, uh, but you're always reacting to the changes that occur in the business, mm -hmm. and, and, that, and, and that's hard sometimes. Mm -hmm. It is hard. And, and when you're seeing a fourth generation family, drug, 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 drug. And it has to be depressing to you. It is. And, and because it's lives lost. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, when you get down to the, uh, you know, third and fourth generation, it becomes a, a lifestyle, yeah. really. Yeah. And, and they don't know anything other than that. Exactly. Do you remember the years, and I can't remember exactly what year, but my daughter's roommate died from an overdose, and I thought it was my daughter. And um, I actually called and told the funeral home, go ahead and pick her up and get her ready, and I'd be up there with her clothes. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what? And I said, oh yeah, I heard on the scanner her address. And they said, no, that was her roommate. Mm -hmm. She was older than her. And I said, oh my God. But there was a, a, a summer, we called it the summer of evil, because I think 11 people died from the same batch of drugs mm -hmm. that were sold and distributed in Pickens and Gilmer County. Mm -hmm. And um, you couldn't stop the crisis. And you couldn't tell people, don't do this, because you know that was an easy drug to get. And, and we were seeing lives lost. Yeah, there, there's an initiative uh, now, and we're actually gonna have some training on it in a couple of weeks. Uh, the federal government, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Atlanta has an initiative that they are uh, willing to and actively pursuing uh, drug dealers that sell uh, their product, in, in that case, uh, mainly fentanyl, mm -hmm. to someone who then overdose and die. Mm -hmm. And they're going after the dealer uh, for the death, mm -hmm. and, as and they that's should. the way it should be. Yes, as they should, as they should. When when we look at the, the drugs, and I mean, we all know somebody who's been affected by it. We all have probably attended a funeral of somebody who, who died from it. But when we think about that, it's not a choice you make because that's how you want to live your life. Something puts you in a position that you think that's going to make you feel better. And drugs do not make you feel better. Right. You know, they destroy everything from inside out. And um, I, I can imagine when you see, because North Georgia has been plagued with it for many, many years. Right. And it doesn't seem to be getting any better, but they're getting, and, and somebody told me the other day that they were talking about a drug of choice now and that it is so expensive and so deadly. And I'm thinking, seriously, mm -hmm. it's expensive and it's deadly and you become hooked on this. So where's the brain, you know? Yeah. What, 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 what can we do to stop this? Yeah, you know, the fentanyl is, is a, a, a painkiller. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, it's very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And the danger with fentanyl is some of the other drugs on the street are being uh, cut with fentanyl. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's, there's an enormous amount of overdose uh, from, from that. Right. Uh, because fentanyl is so powerful uh, that people are just doing it one time and dying. Well, there was a, a, a family down in Bridge Mill, very, very nice community, and the family was having a yard sale and selling their son's things. He overdosed three weeks before that. Mm. One, one, one time. One time. And he was a Kennesaw State student, 
and had his whole life before him. And um, his parents were sadly selling everything he had because they were going to move away, get away. They didn't want to keep anything. They didn't want to see anything. They were getting rid of his car. They were getting rid of everything because they couldn't handle it because he went to college one day. And then on a Saturday night, he died, mm -hmm. you know. And so he didn't intend to die. He just needed to feel better. Right. And, and that's the scary thing because what makes you feel better will also end your life. That's right. How do you educate people? Well, um, by, by talking about it, like this show, mm -hmm. uh, and, and making sure that people understand, because a lot of times this has started with prescription mm -hmm. uh, painkillers. Mm -hmm. And although they will help you short term with your pain, uh, they can also, and we've seen, uh, lead to other drugs because once those painkillers aren't prescribed, right, and 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 the, the the person's addicted, then they have to go to the street, right, and and that's what we've seen an influx of heroin uh, in North Georgia, which we used to never see. Somebody, actually, somebody recently whose child is having a real serious problem told me that heroin was a cheaper drug. It is cheap, and then it was easier to get and cheaper, and um, and I'm like, and it's deadly. And they said, yeah, but she said, you know, she goes down to Bankhead Highway to get it. Yeah. I'm like, are you kidding me? That's right. Are you kidding me? That is so scary. Yep. And you would put that in your body. Yep. And know that it could be life or death. Every day. Every day. Every day. We, we've got to stop it, you know. And, and one of the things everybody knows, I've gone red for a reason. I'm a diehard conservative. I'm a diehard Republican. I'm a diehard deplorable. We need funding. We need funding for mental health because if, if you're on drugs, if I'm on drugs, I got a mental problem because I don't do drugs. I barely do Advil. But, but you have something in your life that has either depressed you or brought you down. Maybe you were molested. Maybe you felt abandoned. Maybe your parents left you. Something happened that made you want to feel better. And they need mental health and we need counseling. Yeah. We need money. We need funding. Right. And, and, uh, or they've had an injury. Right. Uh, or a surgery yeah. that's, yeah. that's uh, caused them to You don't wake addicted. up one day and decide you want to be a drug addict. No. 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 You know, I used to go to schools and talk to kids, and, and one of the first times I did, there was an eighth grader there, and I was telling kids, if you know of somebody who's doing drugs, who's making drugs, who's selling drugs, I'm going to give you a phone number I want you to call, and it was Judge Brenda Weaver's number. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, you can report this. And after, after we talked, a little boy came up and he said, ma'am, and he had his head held down. He said, could you tell me how to get in touch with that lady you were talking about? And I said, yes, absolutely. And so he and I talked and, and then one of his teachers walked over and she said, can I ask you what he said? And I told her, I said, he just needed some information. And she said, had this horrible feeling about that child because he sleeps through class because he never gets any rest at night mm -hmm. and he kept telling me he said we have to move all the time because my daddy's always running from the law mm -hmm. and I thought there are teachers who can identify a child who's in crisis because of their parents drug addiction you know and and God bless the teachers who who see that and identify it right. because then they can try to get the kids help but but these kids that grow up in that um, what choice do they have? Yeah. What are they going to yeah. do? You know, that, that, that's tough. And yeah. that young man, the teacher said, "Oh my God, that answers so many questions," because she said, "I always wondered why does he sleep in class? Why does he come in looking like he looks? Why does he? You can tell he hasn't been bathed. You can tell, you know, and and those are the things. It's not the kid's fault. No, it's not no. the kid's fault. No. And we see that generation after generation, and it just um, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. But, yeah. But we can make a difference, and hopefully, now that you're working part time in Pickens County, <laughs> full time. Full time. Yeah. Full time. Full time. Full time. <laughs> you can make a difference. <laughs> well, if y'all want to pick up this book, I want to encourage you. Those days in January, it is a sad story. It is a true story. It is the end of a 30-year career that, um, honestly, um, this is a story that we all wanted a different outcome. And um, I hope that I get to live to see the day that this man is executed. Yeah. Because I certainly believe in the death penalty, and I, I certainly believe that that's what needs to happen to him. And um, nothing can bring her back. You know, have you kept in touch with her parents? I did for a while, uh, for a good long while after this. But did I she had, have siblings? I had one younger brother. Okay.
and it just um, it, it will be forever these mountains all still feel the hurt and the sorrow for for the loss of this beautiful young lady right. and it was just because she chose to take her dog for a walk That's that right. day absolutely right. innocent and it sadly ended her life and it's because there is evil out there and we have to you know we have a choice in life i guess there is good and evil and we have to decide to identify the evil and if you see something that looks bad if you see something that doesn't look right call a tip call. line That's call right. somebody identify it if you see somebody who's selling drugs call and identify it if you see something that looks like a child you know one of the hardest things to identify is a kid who is being abused at home um, pick up the phone and call somebody if you're a teacher you certainly can see that and and it is one of those things that we can make a difference and we can be the good against the evil because there is some evil and uh, I hope you'll come back to visit with us soon. I will. Thank you for and having me. I hope me. your book sales soar. Thank you. Now, again, this is on Amazon. And how else can people pick it up? Is that the best way to get it? That's the best way to get it. Uh, you okay. can uh, the book Logics, the publisher. You can all also get it there. But Amazon's probably the easiest okay. for people. Those days in January, a story of a, a thirty-year career and um, sadly a, a very, very, a very sad ending. Now tonight we're going to have a happy ending. The election will probably not end tonight, although today is election day and I want to encourage you. I have on read, John has on read, we have on read for a reason. Conservative, um, I hope that you will get out and vote. I hope that you will choose to make America great again. <laughs> it's your choice. And um, I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow or not. I have this thing. I don't drink and I don't smoke. I cuss a little. And I said, if tomorrow's outcome, I don't know how it's going to be. I don't know if I'm going to get any sleep tonight or not. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm going to be here in the morning or not. I may be sitting here with my eyes held open with toothpicks. We don't know what's going to happen, but we know that America will still be the greatest nation in the world. We are watched over by the Lord Almighty. He is going to take care of us no matter what happens. And I hope that something very positive happens. I hope that today you will pray for a great outcome for America. I hope you will gather with your friends, pick up the phone and call somebody, remind them if they haven't voted to please go out and vote. Every single vote counts. Every single moment of doing something for somebody else will come back to bless you and we all have the opportunity to do that. So do that today. Make today election day a day that you do something good over evil because um, we are living in a world where there is evil, and, and you have lived it for 30 years. You've seen some cases that um, it, it, it's crazy, and um, it is in our world today, and we have the ability to stop it and to help it and to make a difference. We're going to leave you now where rivers, mountains, and good friends meet, coming to you from ETC in beautiful downtown Ella J, Georgia. We'll see you again soon.